ultimately we decided that we will call upon uh, honorable mr justice ak jayashankar nabiar for a topic which on the face of it looks very interesting after the topic was finalized i never myself realized that the issues are on different aspects one thought that it's simpliciter uh, only on protection eventually one realizes there are different acts namely that is prevention of cruelty to the animals act then we have for the transportation of the animal protection act then we have wildlife protection act these all acts and rules have their own facets and they protect the animals in a different way as to whether what can be slaughtered how the animals can be used and uh, how the animals and the pets can be kept at their own place there are all the issues which are the issues which can only be unraveled by honorable mr justice ak jay shankar nambiar once we see on the google it's uh, or on the website of the kerala high court we find his illustrious career that is he is a gold medalist plus he is an lmns of oxford both the issues regarding being a gold medalist speaks volume for itself and studying and being an lmns of the oxford it's a, another fascinating fact as in hindi uh, those who could understand they say sone pe suhaga it is uh, or in the english we can say cherry on the top once it's a combination of both and having an insights on a different issue which invariably even as a student of law or as a professional one feels there is not much except for the public interest litigation uh, without taking much time on behalf of beyond law clc i request honorable mr justice akin uh, shankar shankar um, nambiar to give the insights people are quite large number of people had sent on the whatsapp what could be the issues and large number of people had seen on the chat box they in fact wanted to record this to the participants we will just like to highlight this entire session would be also on the facebook number 1 and number 2 after the session is over we will also upload the same on the uh website as well as on the youtube channel of beyond law clc so all those who have missed it or they all those who want to revisit the entire session and can do that uh, thank you sir we are enamored for the fact that you have uh, accepted our invite and you will be giving insights which invariably are not known to a common person thank you sir thank you vikas uh i first of all uh, i just want to confirm i am i audible am i yes okay thank you um vikas you gave me a scare during the course of your uh, introduction um i heard you at some point say that uh, you know people were not very conversant about the rights of animals and uh, most people were under the assumption that rights of animals were almost non existent um uh, i don't believe that many of the, that is the public perception um uh, i i'm sure there are many who think that uh, animals have indeed rights and uh, i think the unanimous opinion today is that those rights are not sufficient um let me begin by taking you all back in time just two weeks uh, ago there was this incident in kerala which shook the uh, conscience of the citizenry uh, you all are aware of it it was the news item that appeared in the dailies about an elephant um, a pregnant elephant at that um, a wild elephant which met its tragic end because it consumed uh, some pineapple that was laced with explosive substances now one version has it that uh, the uh, pineapple with the explosive substance was offered to the elephant uh, by some persons in the locality um, and the other version uh, which came out subsequently has it that uh, this was actually some pineapple with explosive substance that was laid uh, in a place by some agriculturists who were not so happy with wild boar having come and attacked their crop and destroyed their crop and therefore they had laid this as a trap to actually kill the wild boar not that that makes killing the wild boar a justifiable act because either or uh, ha uh, 
uh, what I would like to uh, bring to your focus in that news item is that while the end result of the entire episode is certainly a tragic one, it's certainly a deplorable one, and certainly unanimously denounced in society. When you look at the denouncement or the anger expressed at the perpetrator of the, of the uh, uh, offense, as it were, or the deed, you find that the level of anger is not the same in both the situations. In the first situation, the anger level is very high because you see uh, this whole thing as a person having fed an elephant a positive act of feeding an elephant with a hazardous substance. In the second version, you see this as something that a person has done in order to protect his, uh, uh, his uh, crop or agricultural produce uh, from destruction by wild animals. And therefore, uh, the level of uh, anger expressed against that perpetrator, that person, seems to be a tad below what is expressed in the case of the other. Now, I ask myself why that why that different approach? Or why is it that there is a different perspective when you, have, when you express anger at something that is so blatantly cruel? And I, I, and I, I find that uh, it is largely an issue of perspective because uh, we tend to, as human beings, uh, we tend to see the rights of animals as subservient to the rights enjoyed by us as a species, human beings. Um, over the years, we seem to have managed to dominate life on Earth and also arrogate ourselves to ourselves the, uh, the ability to lay siege on the resources that are uh, available on this planet. If you look back in time to the earliest days of life on planet Earth, and if you start off on the, on the common ground of all species being equal, uh, in planet Earth. Survival of the fittest would have been the natural law that determined your continued existence on this planet. Going by that yardstick and going by that principle, uh, human beings would not, in my opinion, have survived uh, the onslaught either of nature or of the other uh, wild animals or uh, you know, species around us for the simple reason that we are not as powerful as them when you look at it in terms of physical existence. However, humanity and human kind, human beings as a species survived because of one innate quality of theirs, and that is the ability to actually socialize in groups and in huge groups. This is the one feature that distinguishes a human being from the rest of the animal kingdom, the ability to socialize. And not merely socialize, because you find that there are other species like dogs and wolves, uh, or even lions, for that matter, who do socialize and move in packs. It's called the pack behavior in the animal kingdom. But the human species uh, has the innate ability to socialize at a much, much larger level. And therefore, the huge grouping that we've resorted to is what has largely helped us survive uh, and dominate, eventually dominate the uh, planet itself. So why did we do this? We did this obviously for the reason that we could now protect ourselves from common enemies. We could, we could uh, use or uh, pool our resources to actually fight the forces of nature, to fight the common enemies, to ward off evil. And in that process, we unknowingly came to create what is the first sort of government of ourselves. So this is the essence of our banding together. So this is our essence of social existence. It is a coexistence, peaceful coexistence, designed for common good of protecting our species from the onslaught from both nature as also other species. This banding together, this formation of a society and this level of governance obviously led to uh, a situation where, as an individual, you would have to give up certain privileges, you would have to give up certain uh, rights for the benefit of the uh, common society. You can call it, uh, there are various theories of jurisprudence, I'm not going into that, but largely it's, it's something like a social contract. So
so you you basically agree with the rest of the persons in your flock that you would curtail your uh, your privileges you would curtail your or uh, restrict your freedoms in such a way that uh, it would benefit the rest of the community why i'm saying all this is that if you reflect on it our approach to the animal rights issue is also on similar lines you would see that our enacted laws and we essentially have just two of them it is uh, in india we have the prevention of cruelty to animals act the pca and the wildlife protection laws now both these work on the fundamental premise and this is important because we seem to have arrogated to ourselves the 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 position of being the most superior uh, species on earth and both these legislations essentially work on the basic premise of superiority of the human species and everything else being subservient to the human species um in law or in general you would call this um speciesism just like you would say capitalism or communism there is something called speciesism um and uh, it's not merely a nomenclature uh, it is basically uh, intended to convey the message that if animals do have rights if animals do have some protection it is because of the benevolence of the human species it is because of the compassion that we have chosen to confer or to show to this uh, species right if that is the basic premise on which our laws are founded and uh, uh, a reading of the uh, the pca act or the wildlife protection act would clearly reveal uh, this to be the case the question that we need to ask ourselves is is that the right approach that we need to take um the answers that you would get to that question if asked in society today uh, uh if you'd asked this question about 20 30 years ago uh you would probably get the answer, uh, mixed responses but i think uh today um the answer would be an emphatic no uh, uh from a majority of the society you see when it comes to when it comes to uh conferring rights on another species which is admittedly uh inferior to you in society in in you know, on the planet you have to consider that this we uh, evolution thus far and because of our deeds we have now reached a position where we command enormous powers and our level of dominance on the planet is substantially high that at this level it would not do us any substantial harm to concede to the other species certain rights which they can enjoy without causing any harm to us and that i think is the is the principle that should inform our uh, our jurisprudence at least our uh, thought process when we talk about conferring rights on animals uh if you were to draw a parallel from from uh, you know constitutions or the law or regulations governing humans itself you would find that the success of any constitution the world over in any juris, uh, jurisdiction the success of any constitution lies in the extent of anti majoritarianism that it practices in other words the success the success of any constitution as a as a as a, law, a legal document would uh, would stem from the extent of protection it offers to the minorities and uh, not to the majority so taking cue from that principle if you were to apply the same principle on a on a global level on a on a planetary level we would be living up to the our, our uh, uh, position or our claim as a civilized body of people if and only if we recognize certain rights in those species which have not uh, received the advantage of rights and have not been able to exploit the natural resources in the same way that we have been uh, exploiting when at the end of the day they are also equally entitled as living creatures to the uh, bounty that nature has to offer so with that introduction let let's let's go a little bit in uh, detail to what is the steps that we can actually take uh, with regard to advancement of the animal welfare or animal rights 
Now, to talk about our constitution and our legal system, the constitution, of course, is the is a basic law uh, in India. The constitution, as you all know, came in um, 1950. Um, we adopted it in 1949. Came into effect January 26, 1950. When the constitution was enacted and when the constitution uh, came into force, there was a chapter in the constitution and it's still there, uh, uh, containing chapter four, which is the directive principles of state policy. Now, article 48A of the constitution, which is, a, which is an article under the chapter of directive principles of state policy, says or speaks about protection and improvement of environment and safeguarding of forests and wildlife. It's just one sentence in the constitution. But that is, that is good because it's not very many constitutions the world over that actually recognize such a protection uh, or such, or, or even talk about animals. You would have uh, a lot of mention of animals and protection of animals in the German constitution. Uh, you would find it in some other constitutions, uh, uh, but it's, not, it's certainly not a uniform approach the world over. And to that extent, at least, I think the, the initiatives that we have taken in our country is far better and uh, far more progressive. Now, the problem with the uh, mention in the directive principles of state policy, um, and I'm presuming that uh, many of you are law students or at least have something to do with law here. Uh, for those who don't, uh, it, I, I can clarify that in, under the Indian law, um, directive principles of state policy, although mentioned in the constitution, are not directly enforceable in a court of law. So, uh, and that's not to say that it can be conveniently ignored. Uh, the law on the point is that directive principles of state policy, although not enforceable as a right in a court, you can, the, the legislature, the state has definitely to take note of the principles while they make laws, they, they enact laws. And certainly the judiciary, when it's interpreting the various provisions of statutes, have to keep in mind the directive principles and interpret it accordingly. So it's not as though it is, it is to be ignored. It is there. It's a constitutional provision at the end of the day. But when you, when you do interpret it, you need to keep this in the background. You cannot go directly to court saying, this, there is a directive principle, please enforce it. Now, our constitution, as I said, came in 1950. It was not until 1977 that the constitution was amended to bring in a chapter 4A on fundamental duties. So it took us 27 years to insert a chapter in the constitution talking about fundamental duties of citizens. And there, in, uh, in that chapter, for the first time, you find there are two duties with, which have some bearing on animal rights. And those are Article 51G and Article, uh, sorry, Article 51AG and Article 51AH. Now, what do they say? Um, Article 51AG obliges every citizen to protect and improve natural environment including forests, lakes, rivers, and wildlife to protect and, and to have compassion for living creatures, underscore. Compassion and to have compassion for living creatures. We'll come back to those words in a minute. Article 51, capital A, H, obliges us to develop scientific temper, humanism, and the spirit of inquiry and reform. The word to be noticed there, underscored there, is humanism, right? Now, as I said earlier, when I mentioned about the directive state, uh, principles of state policy, like the directive principles, fundamental duties also, you cannot go to court to enforce them, right? But like directive principles of state policy, you have to keep them in mind when the state makes laws, when the judiciary decides cases. So these armed with these concepts uh, which are inserted now and which have got a constitutional footing in our country. What do we do? How do we go forward? Now, keep in mind the fact that it was 1977 that we got the uh, constitution amended to insert fundamental duties. And yet, it was not until 2014, that, 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 that year is magic as far as animal rights is concerned. Uh, it was not until 2014 that we actually took concrete steps uh, for advancing our animal rights jurisprudence. 
what did we do from 1977 when fundamental duties was inserted in the constitution till 2014 which i was talking about actually it was uh, we 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 started interpreting the provisions of the uh, pca act as well as the wildlife protection act in a manner that was spelled out in the legislation itself uh, as i said earlier the fundamental premise on which these legislations are based is the superiority of the human species and the protection of rights of animals is seen as as some kind of a a charity or a, uh, or a or a compassion that is shown by the human species to animals so the the protection of rights you would see in these two legislations uh, is or the concern for animal welfare is addressed through control of human action it is uh, these legislations basically speak of duties that a citizen owes to animals and therefore you have uh sections 3 of the pca act and section 11 which talk about various things that a human being should not do what you would find there however is that there are exceptions carved out in situations where any activity is not seen cruel if it would aid in some human interest right so you're still talking about a speciesism you're still talking about the superior uh or dominant role that we play on planet earth you're still talking about the subservience of all other species to the human species and you're recognizing certain amount of rights provided that they don't offend your sense of entertainment your sense of or your privileges of uh, of religion uh, religious practices etc now the question to be asked is once your constitution talks about compassion for living creatures and an element of humanism how do you reconcile this with this approach that we have in our in our statutes of the protection of animals being dependent upon the benediction or the benevolence of of the human species there was an inconsistency and this was an inconsistency that needed to be addressed let's look at one of those cases that was decided in 2000 um it's a it's a famous case and it will give you an idea about how uh the courts have viewed the provisions of the uh, prevention of uh, cruelty to animals act uh the case is nr nayar versus union of india it's uh, for those of you who are into citations ar 2001 supreme court 2337 that's ar 2001 supreme court 2337 um essentially it it was a challenge by certain persons who uh who were parading animals for in connection with circus they were uh not so happy with a with a notification issued by the central government which said uh that they could not uh parade or even you know use these animals such as bears and leopards etc for various uh, antics that you normally you and I have seen in our younger days uh in circuses now their argument legally was that this was basically this restriction that was imposed on them was essentially a a restriction an unreasonable restriction on their fundamental right under article 191g for carrying on trade and uh, business what did the supreme court do or what did the high court at first instance and the supreme court do um uh, it was fairly simple they said article 19 grants no doubt uh, guarantees you certain privileges and certain freedoms but those freedoms are not absolute you you have 192 uh, to 6 which talk about restrictions reasonable restrictions 1916 says that you can have a reasonable restriction uh, in respect of uh, 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 you know public interest when you have a chapter on fundamental duties in the constitution which talks about compassion for living creatures and you have a provision under the pca act and a notification issued under the pca act which is designed to show compassion for living creatures by preventing certain activities which would otherwise be viewed as cruelty can you say that that condition is not a reasonable restriction and the supreme court said it it did amount to a reasonable restriction and therefore you could not uh, say that your fundamental freedoms under 191 uh, g were uh, were infringed so 
in that case, we basically find that again, the protection of the animal uh, welfare or protection of animal rights is ensured through a curtailment of the rights or freedoms or fundamental freedoms of the individual or the human being. What happened after that? 2014, and this is the, this is the uh, uh, year which marks a year of celebration for most of the animal rights activists in our country. Uh, I certainly was most happy hearing this. Uh, we had the decision in uh, Nagaraj, Animal Welfare Board of India versus Nagaraj. Now, uh, decision is 2014, 7 SCC 547. 2014, Volume 7, SCC 547. Nagaraj virtually changed the entire perspective on uh, animal rights. Nagaraj shifted the uh, focus from being from animal rights being merely the product of a control on human action to recognizing rights in animals itself and using affirmative state action to protect those rights. Right? For those of you who are uh, students of constitutional law uh, and who would recall, we went through a similar process when it comes to us human beings and us citizens and non-citizens in India. When we were talking about our constitutional provisions under part three, we went through a similar transformation, a shift in the, manner, uh, in the perspective of interpret interpretation of fundamental rights. From the days of Gopalan, A.K. Gopalan versus uh, State of Madras, 1950 case. In fact, it was probably one of the first cases decided by the first landmark cases decided by the newly formed Supreme Court in 1950. Uh, in Gopalan, part three of our constitution, which deals with fundamental rights, it was, it was seen as a protection granted to the citizens, which protection was ensured through a curtailment or a, or a restriction of state action. So the focus was, if you got a protection of fundamental rights under part three, it was because you could successfully control or restrict state action under the constitution. And therefore, article 21 was seen as a right to life and personal liberty, subject to compliance by the state of a fair procedure established by law. So as long as the state had a procedure established by law, they could take away your life of, under, of uh, personal liberty. So the only protection you had under the constitution, according to the Gopalan uh, bench, was that your protection was only to the extent of limitation of state action or control of state action. And the Gopalan view started, uh, it is famously called as the si silos theory because it started seeing uh, the fundamental rights as individual fundamental rights. Uh, the right under article 19 was separate from the, art, uh, the right under article 14, which was also separate from the art, uh, rights under articles 20, 21, 22. It was called the silos theory because you have silos, uh, individual compartments uh, of these rights. And the restrictions were those which were mentioned under those very articles. Now that view of Go in Gopalan of seeing the guarantee of fundamental rights to citizens and non-citizens as resulting from a restriction of state action was departed from in a famous case of R.C. Cooper, which is the bank nationalization case in, uh, in the 1970s. So it took about 20 years for us to have that shift in perspective. Now, what did R.C. Cooper do? R.C. Cooper shifted the focus and said that the, the guarantee of fundamental rights is not achieved through restriction on state action. The guarantee of fundamental rights is through a recognition of the rights of an individual. And affirmative state action to protect the, those rights of the individual. So you saw this shift uh, for the human beings. <laughs> I'm sorry to be using the word human beings because when you're talking in the context of animal rights, you need to uh, treat citizens and non-citizens as human beings as against uh, animals. So when, you, when the focus shifted, this was what happened in 1970s as far as we human beings are concerned. Our fundamental rights under part three came to be recognized as individual rights which required 
a guarantee through affirmative state action. It is that shift in perspective that is happening in the animal world today or in 2014. So you can easily draw a parallel between what happened in under part three when you're talking about the corresponding rights uh, maturing to animals through the uh, statutory prescriptions under the uh, Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act as also the Wildlife Protection Act. Now, what did Nagaraj do apart from taking this shift in perspective? Nagaraj interpreted the provisions of the PCA Act in the backdrop of the fundamental duties, in the backdrop of the uh, chapter on, uh, on directive principles, and said that you stop seeing these rights conferred under these acts on animals as, uh, as merely the result of prevention or uh, restriction of the actions of human beings. You see them as individual rights. Now, they recognized these rights under sections three and section 11 as comprising of five freedoms which were inherent in all animals. And these freedoms are important. Um, it was a freedom from hunger, thirst, and malnutrition, the first freedom. The second was the freedom from fear and distress. Third, the freedom from physical and thermal discomfort. Fourth, the freedom from pain, injury, and disease. And five, this is important, freedom to express normal patterns of behavior. And mind you, we are talking about these freedoms in animals. So if these five freedoms are recognized as forming an inherent part of sections 3 and 11 of the Prevention of uh, uh, the Cruelty to Animals Act, the PCA Act, and they are to be protected as individual rights, and the judgment goes on to elaborate that these are rights inherent in animals, um, inherent means that they were always there. Uh, and it has to be protected by the state by invoking the principles of parents patriae. Now parents patriae is a doctrine which is, uh, which is used in any society where the, uh, which is the, where the governance is paternalistic. Uh, parents patriae simply means like your parents would do. So uh, like a child would be taken care of by the parents for any laws would be interpreted uh, in favor of the person that is sought to be protected. And therefore, the obligation was left to the state to ensure that these rights, in, uh, which were declared to exist in animals, would now be protected by the state action. This would mean that, or this would have, uh, I would have thought, would require the state to now step in and make consequential changes in the uh, legislations that we have, because they are all of 1960 vintage. Uh, the uh, shift in had not happened till 2014. And there is a reason why you need affirmative state action, because there are many things that happen through just a legislation being there, because the law is clear for everybody to apply. And it also informs society in general that this is the law. There is no, there is no gray area. Uh, not everybody in society goes to read judgments of the Supreme Court. But when there is a law, there is a presumption that you know the law. Uh, and you know that the legislature has passed such a thing. Why would have expected the uh, legislature, uh, either the parliament or even subordinate legislation, to react or to respond to the call made by the Supreme Court in Nagaraj and make amendments, either amendments to the statute or just replace the existing statute with a new one, which would conform to the ideals uh, and the uh, ideals expressed by the Supreme Court in, in uh, Nagaraj. But I'm sorry to say that although there were two animal welfare bills, both of 2011 and 2014, none of them have become acts. They've not been passed. But then, as a country, as a republic, India has not been known for prompt legislative action anyway. Uh, timely legislation has never been a strong point. Uh, I say this with all conviction because uh, for those law students again and lawyers, uh, if you remember, uh, when it came to uh, an issue that was faced in society, the, the issue of sexual harassment of women in workplaces, uh, you all know the now famous Vishaka case. 
where the Supreme Court laid down guidelines that uh, where to uh, ignore and where to be uh, the law till such time as the legislature made a law to deal with the issue. The Vishaka guidelines and the legislature came in 2013. Now, if it takes settings, the legislature. Um, is there something wrong with the voice? Vikas, is there? Yeah, okay. So, uh, if, if it takes 17 years for the legislature to step in and make a law, then that's certainly not a desirable state of affairs because the legislature is supposed to act and respond to the, to the, uh, uh, to the uh, needs of the society at any given point in time. And Vishaka is not the only case. If you look at uh, the food security laws, the uh, decision in the, uh, in the People's Union for Civil Liberties came somewhere in 2000. The food security legislation came only in 2010. So 10 years again. And why? We have a case in point even today. 2014 is the Nagaraj decision. In 2020, we don't have any legislation yet or not even an amendment worth its mention. So this is a point for uh, concern. Uh, this is something that has to be addressed uh, when we are talking about the uh, animal welfare legislation or animal rights uh, issue. Now what's happening on the international front? There too, you find there is a woeful uh, gap in the legislations. Uh, there are not many international conventions worth mentioning which would actually uh, you know, go to the extent of providing rights to animals uh, that could be enforceable the world over. Uh, we have, uh, there has been a toying with an idea of universal declaration of animal rights on the same lines as universal declaration of human rights, but that has never actually uh, matured into a reality. Uh, we have various organizations like the World Society for Protection of Animals, uh, which is now called the World, Protect the World Animal Protection since 2014, uh, after the merger of two bodies together to form the new one. And uh, the uh, World Health Organization for Animal Health, uh, OIE, uh, of which India is a member, uh, the declarations by them uh, are not actually uh, instruments that can be universally enforced. So we have we have a, a situation today where uh, the only law that actually enables uh, a recognition of animal rights today is the law laid on by the Supreme Court and the law laid on by the Supreme Court on how to interpret the provisions of the uh, PCA Act and the uh, Wildlife Protection Act. Now. We could speculate on the way forward, uh, and uh, there are mixed reactions as to how we should go. Certainly, certainly, a legislation uh, affirming the principles of positive state action would be uh, desirable, and it should come in the near future. And I, I'm not saying it should come because I have an expectation that it would come. I'm saying it should come because I expect civil society to respond and to take the initiative to actually cause the legislation to come into force. And this can be achieved only through participation of civil society. And I'm, I'm emphasizing on this point because uh, knowing how uh, governance happens in our country, knowing how the laws are made and how laws are implemented, I believe that for a law to be effectively implemented in our society, it requires a process of internalization by the society. I'm, I'm a firm believer that if a law is to be truly obeyed and respected by society, it must be a law that is internalized by society. In, this, in other words, the law must be accepted, must be acceptable to society. They must, they must understand that this is required. Today, going by, coming back to the elephant example, which I, uh, the elephant incident which I mentioned at the outset, I believe, going by the responses that we had when the incident was published, was, uh, was circulated in the uh, social media as also the uh, visual and uh, print media, the reaction from the citizenry 
was very very encouraging i'm not saying that the i'm not uh, saying that the incident was justified but the reaction of civil society gives a ray of hope that today there is enough voice in society that would catalyze uh, uh, a legislation uh, to protect or to uh, promote animal rights now let's see what the power of society is if you look at if you look at the developments across the world uh, where uh, animal rights have been protected animal rights have been recognized you would be you would you would uh, notice that the opinion of the public the opinion of the citizenry wherever be uh, uh, citizen where the location of the city is paramount and is uh, and plays a significant role in shaping of the laws that are then made by the legislatures respective legislatures of those countries uh, let's look at uh some of the happenings in the world uh, trade order the world trade organization uh there are two cases of uh, for those of you who are interested one is called the us tuna case uh and this is basically uh, the facts the, the citation is not important the facts are this uh the us tuna case was basically uh dealing with the the packaging of tuna fish now you see when uh, the tuna fish are, uh, are capture or uh, when when the, the tuna fish is caught okay the uh, process that was employed was uh, using nets and uh, for those of you who uh, who watched uh, uh, attenborough's living planet etc you would be remember that tuna fish uh, as shoals of fish swim under dolphins and uh, there was a peculiar uh, problem because when they were catching tuna fish because there would be uh, dolphins also come to feed on the fish so wherever they spotted dolphins they would know that there was a shoal of tuna underneath and nets would be cast and the the fish would be caught but in that process a lot of dolphins were harmed because they would get entangled in the nets they would uh, you know the the fins would rupture etc and this was a major concern for all the animal lovers uh, for those who showed compassion to animals and uh, it created quite a spark and uh, it was quite, quite the, the there was activists who raised a uh, hue and cry with regard to these practices with the result that there came there came about a, a requirement to actually put labels on cans of tuna that were prepared uh, that were produced showing clearly that this was dolphin safe that there was no dolphins harmed in the capture of the tuna that was now inside the can um mexico as a country uh raised certain concerns because they said that they could not comply with the uh, procedural requirements that require that were required for getting a dolphin safe label uh for their tuna which they had got they therefore went to the world trade uh, organization and said that this insistence on a label for tuna fish would mean that they were actually uh, adversely discriminated in the matter of trade of tuna fish the world trade organization rejected that contention uh, because it was found that this was for a cause which was far more important it was for the purposes of protecting the rights of protecting the dolphins as a species and therefore this was a reasonable restriction that was justified under the circumstances and while arriving at that conclusion they went uh they relied heavily on the public opinion uh of the time a similar case uh which originated in canada and uh, and norway was the uh, uh the seal products case uh, the seals uh, uh which were caught uh where the the method of hunting of seals was seen as very cruel and therefore the world trade organization again uh, imposed certain restrictions on the uh, seal products that that were entering the european market uh, from canada and and norway um, obviously these countries raised a hue and cry with regard to these uh, restrictions but those restrictions were eventually upheld and uh, it was said that the public sentiments ag expressed against the uh cruel ways in which the seal was hunted uh was sufficient for them to justify these restrictions 
so public opinion and public uh, anguish expressed is certainly something that paves the way for new law to be made and this is not surprising because uh, as as the law students would know um, it, there is a maxim in in uh, law which says salus populi suprema lex salus populi suprema lex salus populi is nothing but public opinion so suprema lex is the supreme law public opinion is the supreme law public interest is the supreme law so if there is an overwhelming public interest that is expressed by society uh, in protection of animals and protection of animal rights then surely there is no law which can override that requirement and if the public opinion is expressed suitably i see no reason why you would not have a legislation coming in you would not force the legislature to act and uh, uh, bring about a suitable legislation which would protect and advance what was already laid down in nagaraj now there is a difficulty when you are talking about legislation uh, you can have you can mount all the public pressure that you want you can raise the public opinion you can bring all the lobbies to bear but when it comes to legislation we have our experience with legislation has been that after the constitution of india which document was drafted most meticulously and the kind of debates and deliberations that went into the making of the constitution unparalleled anywhere else in the world we when it was when it was actually enacted it was the longest constitution in the modern era and uh, the herculean efforts i mean one has to only see the constituent assembly debates if you read the constituent assembly debates you will understand what was the time and effort the the constituent assembly spent about 2 years 11 months uh, just deliberating and discussing on each and every provision of the constitution such an exercise in legislation and drafting has not been seen after 1950 um it may have you may have legislations which uh, uh you know have uh, undergone that process of debate deliberation in earlier parts immediately after the uh, constitution maybe in the first one or two decades but ever since legislative drafting has been a shabby exercise i'm sorry to say this but you find this defect in most of the legislations that we deal with today now legislation whether it is plenary legislation or whether it is Uh, subordinate or delegated legislation for our cause for our purposes it has to be something that is preceded by a discussion by uh, an intellectual discussion by persons experts in the field of animal rights persons who know animal behavior because you cannot make a law you cannot make a law defining rights unless you know what those rights translate into for the animal itself uh, it is meaningless to be speaking of a law a rights of an animal if you don't know what the animal actually likes if you look if you look at uh, the prevention of cruelty to animal you find clauses there saying unnecessary pain and suffering unnecessary pain and suffering suppose somebody were to tell you that uh, you have a right uh, against unnecessary pain and suffering the first question you would ask is unnecessary to whom and <laughs> you you cannot you cannot think of a pain and suffering which is unnecessary for the animal the animal any pain and suffering is is unnecessary so the unnecessary pain and suffering clause itself shows that it is unnecessary and it is for the for the for the human being so you are you are you are you are still uh, defining rights uh, vis a vis the comfort levels of human beings so you need you need a body of experts to go into uh, each aspect of uh animal welfare and then come out with a legislation it can be either a plenary legislation or even subordinate legislation like rules under the pca act but there has to be a thought process going into it if you do not have it and if you do not spend time on it and we've already spent time uh, spent time doing nothing from 2014 to 2020 there's been nothing have a legislation coming in with all this thought process going in and then maybe we can hope for advancing the cause of animal welfare for advancing animal rights uh, jurisprudence in our country now varied are the issues uh, of animal rights that we will be dealing with uh, 
particular problems uh, which you find uh, on a reading of the newspapers and uh, social media itself are the you know the stray dog population parading of elephants uh, prevention of rabies in dogs regulation of working animals like donkeys horses etc um, all these things require uh, require a, a deliberation by expert bodies it can't just be done through legislation alone uh, because if you start uh, giving these issues to the legislators there's going to be absolutely no material with them uh, and they're not experts in the field so they need to be advised uh, to a, to bringing about a legislation in a particular manner courts and i must warn you about this when it comes to advancing a law through courts you must understand the limitations under which the courts operate uh, uh, the litigation in our country is necessarily adversarial you have two sides to a to a litigation all right given that public interest litigation which is what brings most of these uh, uh, laws into bear public interest litigation will have more persons but it all it is all fortuitous you will have persons in pleading you do not know what cause they are supporting they need not be experts and ultimately the court decides based on what is available before the court so the material that is available before the court need not be the real material that would that would clinch the issue or decide the issue of animal rights and there is a danger inherent in that if you ask the court to decide on animal rights they are not experts we are not experts uh, and as a judge i can tell you that uh, although i am a uh, i mean i i i i i am a great lover of animals but uh, that doesn't give me the right to decide on animal rights because i know precious little about uh, how dogs think or how uh, cats would behave in particular situations so what we can do in the judiciary is try and implement those laws which are laid down by the legislature interpret those laws in a manner uh, in conformity uh, with the constitutional principles uh, read in or uh, enforce the obligations of municipal authorities uh, who are obliged to do certain things for example under our municipal laws today you have various provisions which are designed for the welfare of animals uh, take for example the requirement under the municipal laws for creating dog pounds maintaining dog shelters how many municipalities have this facility there is absolutely nothing in most of the municipalities you find dogs uh, roaming all around the streets that's not a bad thing you also require public awareness with regard to what the dogs uh, if it is dogs that you're talking about stray dogs what is the danger posed by stray dogs how do dogs behave not every dog that is on the street is a dangerous animal that needs to be culled so these are aspects that need to engage the attention of expert bodies which expert bodies will ultimately draw uh, you know uh, regulations and uh, methodologies of proceeding and dealing tackling with the issue and then make that into a law only then will we have something concrete which can be enforced through uh through the courts if it is not already respected by uh the citizenry in general another point another lacune which i would point out in our existing legislation is the appallingly low uh monetary penalties that are levied suppose you do some i mean uh, there is a provision under section 11 of the uh, pc act that if you do something offensive you are fined 50 rupees uh okay uh, you're talking about 50000 now by virtue of an amendment but nobody's done uh, nobody's come out to that amendment yet now if you in today's world uh in today's society the only thing that acts as a deterrent is a deprivation or an economic deprivation of a citizen nothing else uh, you 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 threaten a person with sending him to jail he's happily going to the jail he's he, he's not very concerned about it Uh, gone are the days when uh, deprivation of personal liberty used to be seen as uh, as a major deterrent today the jails have become very comfortable and uh, uh, it does not act as a deterrent to the hardest of criminals and now if you look at the violation of animal rights and if you say that hurting a, a street dog or calling a street dog will attract a penalty of 50 rupees or 5000 rupees nobody is going to bother so the deterrent today is through monetary penalty and that monetary penalty has to be significant for it to impact the perpetrator of an offense or a crime so these are uh, little things that will go a long way in ensuring the protection of the rights of animals and now that we have taken this step forward through nagraj i feel that 
civil society must now come out and exert the pressure. The plea must be to the ballot. The, 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 the pressure must be applied to the legislators. And you have to bring in a law uh, which will uh, recognize and which will give a firm, uh, uh, firm foundation to the uh, animal rights that we hold so precious in our country. I, well, that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, I'm, uh, I do anticipate a lot of questions. I hope I'll be able to wield them or feel them. That's true. Yes, uh, the, way, the way they are, uh, the questions are pouring, somehow <clears throat> that was on the other laptop. I've asked the people to repost the questions, but meanwhile I can read. Uh, Swamya, yes. can you please enlighten us about the provision that can bring justice to elephants used on religious occasions? There is, no, as I said, because right at the beginning, we have virtually two legislations on which to bank upon. Uh, one is the Wildlife Protection Act and the other is the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. So we, we have to juggle with these two. Now, uh, when it comes to recognizing any right, now after, after Nagaraj, obviously, uh, we have those five freedoms which I mentioned. Uh, they have been put on the same pedestal as fundamental rights for human beings. So when these five freedoms have been recognized as akin to part three of our constitutions in, the, in, in its application to, animal, in, uh, to human beings, then this is the uh, uh, protection that they have. And if the state is to enforce this, if the state is obliged under the law, and by invoking the doctrine of parents patriae to recognize these rights, then the state has obviously to step in and do some affirmative action to prevent it. So that should be the answer to your question. That is, that is the way forward. Shivam uh, Kumar, how do you see that the slaughtering animals but treating them as um, humanly during their life? Sorry? Uh, how do you uh, feel that slaughtering of the animals is allowed uh, but treating them humanly during their lives. Yeah, the, that, that is the legal conundrum that we've all stuck with. Because uh, when you talk about slaughtering of animals, as I said earlier, the rights that we have conceded to the animals today is only limited. And we have conceded to them only such rights as would not be offensive to human existence. Um, the, the, species, uh, the speciesism that I talked about, is still very much there, inherent in our, in our uh, uh, animal rights laws. Uh, you may be justified in killing an animal if that, is, if that killing is uh, going to be food for the human being. Uh, maybe desirable, maybe debatable, but that's the law today. The exceptions are carved out for necessity, as they call it. Now, that itself is a controversial term. What is a human necessity? Of course, food is a human necessity, but is eating non-vegetarian food human necessity? Debatable, but it is, it, it, it is there to stay. So the definition of necessity is what protects, uh, justifies the killing of the animal for food. But at the same time, till such time as it is killed, it, it has a life. So cruel treatment, short of killing. So if you, if you were to adopt a very cruel method for the killing, that would be offensive. That would be that would still attract the uh, the uh, uh, punishment under the PC Act. Uh, uh, a lot of people are asking, so I can uh, just request you to make a uh, common answer to that. Can you please talk about uh, Jail Cut to uh, case where initially the courts banned the tradition, but later on the legislature amended the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act to exclude buffaloes? Uh, what is your take on that? Not no. legally, but otherwise. Sorry, can you, can you just uh, give me the facts of that? Sir, it, mainly people are wanting uh, the insights on that jail cut to where initially the courts had banned and thereafter the legislature had come. Uh, how, how do we look forward? Uh, Jali that, yeah. is, that is the uh, Jali Kattu was what was decided in the Nagraj case. Yes. Now, so uh, the people are mainly wanting mo more insights on that. It, uh, again, it, it comes back to the issue of necessity. What is the human necessity? Because the exceptions that you've carved, carved out while you're recognizing rights in animals is only on the ground of human necessity. Now, necessity is a very 
nebulous term. It's a very ambiguous term. Um, and it can mean many things at the same time. Now, when you're talking about necessity for food, yes, you can kill an animal if it is, if it is going to be food on your table. Uh, if it is necessity for religion, there you have an answer. If it is a necessity for cultural requirements, but certainly not an end. Uh, we, are, we are narrowing the definition of necessity. We have, we have more or less now uh, tried to see that you know, a necessity will not justify maybe parading and uh, using animals in circuses, etc. But when it comes to uh, cultural requirements or when it comes to uh, religious uh, reasons, you still have, you still have the uh, you know, sentiments of society to deal with. And therefore, the definition of necessity, if you ask me, is the one that has to be uh, uh, carefully thought about, even if you are going to bring about a new law with regard to uh, animal rights protection. Because what is the extent of exceptions that you will carve out? And that has to be, that has to be determined from the society in general. It, it, it is almost like a, you would have to hold a referendum like thing to understand what is the common ground on which society operates. Because uh, it's meaningless to be saying that there should be a law which say if the majority of this, uh, this society uh, decides that you know, this is not to be. Unless it is such a cruel practice that it shocks human conscience, it shocks uh, the, uh, you know, the, the principle of protection of animal welfare. So these are things which will have to evolve uh, on a case-to-case -case basis. Or even before that, if the legislature uh, you know, decides to step in and uh, create a ban on all these activities, then that's it. So there's, re there's really no one-size-fits-all solution uh, when, it, when you talk about necessity, which is recognized as an exception to animal welfare. Yeah. So, uh, Ashwinder Kaur, can you reconcile the killing of animals in the name of religious practice? Do you think that there has to be a legislation to curb, etc.? What is the way forward? It's the same same answer. Um, if you are asking me personally, the answer is no. I don't. I don't justify uh, killing of an animal. But personal opinions cannot come to bear. You know, personal opinions cannot uh, have place in a democracy. Personal opinions will not in a in a civil society. So uh, the answer is uh, the the only answer. The only solution can be legislation. Because that is what reflects the will of the people. So you need to you need to actually come out with legislation, and then we can work on it. You know the, the nuances of the legislation, the the reading into the legislation of concepts which are evolving from time to time, uh, we can do in courts. But the basic legislation defining the uh, the rights, the bare minimum of rights which animals have, has to come through legislation. There's no other way around. Uh, so, the rest of the questions I was taking from the chat. Uh, now, another question I'm taking from the Facebook. Which... I see a question on, uh, on the uh, sir, I can I can read a question from the Facebook. It it says uh, which court to pro approach to file the case under PCA and Wildlife Protection Act. You can go to any court. Uh, you can you, uh, depending on what action you propose. Uh, if you are planning planning to bring in an, it as an offence, uh, you start you go to the criminal courts. Uh, but first, you will have to file a complaint or. Uh, uh, before the police authorities register it as a crime and then take it forward. Um, if you're seeking, uh, uh, you can even come to the high courts with the public interest litigation, um, invoking all these principles and pointing out specific instances of cruelty to animals. So it largely depends upon, I mean, the, 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 the particular court to which you would go would depend upon the action that you propose. Right, sir. Uh, Nishtha, do you think that the zoo culture in India affects the freedom of the wild animals? as they are confined to a particular place or cages? Certainly. Certainly. And uh, the question is, therefore, is it justifiable? Again, it will bring you back to necessity. What is the, what is the human uh, interest that is sought to be preserved through, a, uh, through holding a, uh, an animal in captivity? Uh, if you say no animal should be held in captivity, then you have, in one stroke, 
uh, dealt a blow to all the captive elephants, the captive, uh, you know, other captive wild animals that you keep either in zoos uh, or in natural habitats. Everything goes. But there, you have to, again, draw the balance. So this is something that, ha that needs to engage the attention of society. You need, to, you need to come out with clear guidelines as to what you need and what you don't. And, that is, that, and that's an you know, evolving concept. It depends upon the extent of civility that you've, you've uh, you know, uh, reached in, in civil society. Um, ultimately, this is all a reflection on, the, uh, on how civilized we are, uh, how cultured we are as a society. Now, it, uh, 30 years ago, maybe all this, uh, we treated animals like dirt, you know, uh, they, were to, they were to be subservient to every interest of ours, whether it was entertainment, culture, religion, etc. But today, we, we have reached a level of maturity, we've re, uh, reached a level of, uh, you know, uh, empathy in society, which forces us to abandon some of those uh, old practices. Uh, not everybody favors bullfighting, for example, or, uh, for example, the, uh, you know, the bird fighting. These are all practices which are slowly disappearing. And uh, that uh, will depend upon the extent of civility that we show in, among the citizens. Uh, so we will be unmuting Icha Bujad because she has posed lots of questions. So I thought, uh, yeah, sure. Let her let her put it across straight away to you. Okay. Icha, and so it will be your choice because I, the way the questions are being pouring in, I'm just feeling that it's just like a incessant rain in the Mumbai's. <laughs> so you would have to take a call that when you have to go to the proper shelter when we can. Uh, call for the day because otherwise I personally feel that uh, people are actually enjoying because it's a subject uh, which is sure invariably not touched much. I'm sure it is and, uh, and I'm glad it is engaging the attention of so many because uh, I'm also really concerned about about the uh, uh, the lack of response that we officially see uh, from society because see it's it's all right to have to have a passion for animal welfare, it's all, all right to have compassion. But none, all of that is wasted unless you actually take positive action to bring it to the notice of, of the uh, powers that be and who can influence and change the law in this country. So They say that a point of trigger sometimes actually catalyzes the uh, snowball on the right. That, that's I've unmuted Echa. Uh, Icha, you can, as they say, you can fulfill your Icha by asking the questions of your choice. Though, of course, related to the uh, protection of the animal life. Icha, the meanwhile, I can read. Uh, there have been large number of public voices raised to change the legislation. Uh, Icha says um, she's unmuted. Sorry? Yes. Yes. Uh, so my question is, what are your opinions about police when an FIR is launched about animal cruelty, especially in regard Itcha, to... could you speak slightly uh, louder so that the voice is actually expressed to the public also? So can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah I can. Yeah. Okay, so my, uh, my question is actually, what are your opinions about police when an FIR is launched about animal cruelty, especially in regards to India? Hmm. No, uh, uh, are you asking what my experience has been? Because I, I've not uh, uh, seen any case where come to me saying that the police have not registered a case. But I do believe from what I hear uh, that uh, on a, probably on account of their lack of knowledge of the rights and, and the offenses under the Act, uh, they are a little hesitant to you know, uh, register crimes. Uh, but that's something that has to be addressed through uh, uh, either through approach to courts or otherwise. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't know. I, I suppose it, it varies from state to state. Uh, in, in Kerala, certainly uh, there are cases registered and police are registering cases where uh, offenses are brought to their notice. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Icha? Icha, uh, what is your response there of, uh, sir, she has been, somehow, she had muted herself, we will unmute again. Okay. Because invariably, otherwise, there is uh, so much buzzing, we just
just keep all the mics muted so that we can hear the questions properly yes acha so seeing the cases in maharashtra not even a person is actually put in prison for even a day they bailed the second day or not even the they bailed actually the same day it's a, animal cruelty no, putting in prison is a separate uh, issue uh, uh, i i thought your question was whether a case was registered or not because you see the police have to register the case first uh, when you when you go there and register an fir uh if that is not happening then the criminal process is not set in motion at all but whether or not a person will go to jail is to be determined by the judicial process uh which comes after the registering of the crime so i think you you're confusing between the first two stages or uh, maybe i got it wrong i don't know so tanya says uh, what role do you think that the animal boards are doing and are they doing a positive role or there are certain changes which are actually required for the, uh, them to do no i'm sure the animal board welfare board uh, uh, is aware of the uh, rights that have been recognized in the animals through the decision in nagraj in 2014 um the uh, and i'm sure they uh, they mean well when they uh, when they discharge their duties but uh, the uh, largely it is it is a problem with regard to implementation of those uh, laws in practice um there are varied situations where you do not know what is the extent of the right that has been laid down um in particular cases so um i have no reason to actually believe that the animal welfare board is uh, you know uh, is uh, non sympathetic or apathetic to the uh, to the cause of animals i i i have not come across instances where they have been negligent in their duty right uh so you had mentioned the involvement of experts in the field with regard to formation implementation and enactment of law yes how would one know who consulted the parties are in the terms of proposed notification or questions in notification slash guidelines itself on those grounds the guidelines seems impracticable or unscientific or generally not well justified and have those modified or cost altogether yes because uh, you see when when uh, when i talked about experts i was talking about experts as a consultative body for the legislators to then act to form the legislation now how this works is you would have you would have experts drawing up their conclusions on any particular issue that affects animal welfare and they would then submit their reports to the legislators the legislature would then uh, debate in, uh, on on the pros and cons of those uh, on of those recommendations and then come out with a draft now one of the one of the uh, methods of legislating uh, which is uh, more and more coming into prominence is where the parent uh, the legislation like the pca would envisage a situation where a delegate uh, frames rules and those rules would then be put in the public domain uh, at the draft stage and the public would be asked to comment upon that and once the public opinion comes in the draft would then be finalized taking into account those public uh, views and then you can have the uh, final rules which are again then laid before the legislature and then approved to become statutory rules now this procedure does a lot of uh, has a lot of benefits because if you you are you are simultaneously involving experts you are you are also leaving open the draft uh, rules to public scrutiny all the animal lovers the lobbies everybody can Uh, post their comments on it and those comments are then considered to evolve a, a procedure or a set of rules which would then regulate the field so i think uh, the process has to be one which is transparent which is open and certainly can be done because that uh, it, it is uh, becoming more and more popular uh, as a as a methodology of uh, rule making in our country uh sir purnima so are you able to hear me yeah i can hear you yeah purnima she has posted on the facebook what is happening with the elephants in kerala recently isn't the only shocking news we have heard from india's most literate state quite a while back there were increased cruelty towards the stray dogs in kerala videos went viral on social media platform where people were seen torturing the poor animal people hanging kittens to as an attempt to attain fame has given the glimpse of 
rise of dark trait of personalities in the current form how do you think that we should deal all such things uh you see the straight answer to that is uh, uh, what the british would say one swallow does not a summer make so it is not just one incident that paints the entire state of kerala as uh, as a bunch of cruel people i mean uh, i i i think it would be uncharitable to just say that one incident uh, you know would uh, paint the entire state of kerala as uh, comprising of citizens who are completely apathetic to the cause of animals in fact uh, uh kerala has got a lot of animal lovers and in fact uh, the uh, indian society generally i mean when you're talking about when you look at the history of uh, indian society right from the ancient times uh, our concern for animals has been unparalleled uh, when you look at uh, the treatment of animals in any other country because it is compassion for animals is something that is infused in our very culture um, whether you look at uh, you know uh, in any religion or even uh, even in your local culture you would find a lot of respect for animals uh, through the ages and it is not something that uh, uh, i mean it's certainly something we have to be proud of and it's not something that we acquired recently it is it has always been a part of our culture uh, so one question which invariably uh, just comes in the mind of everyone is like there are stray dogs whenever we go and some people feel that the stray dogs actually are some people feel that it's a nuisance so they should be shot down or they should be taken to at some place some people feel that the only way out is that they should be sterilized so that there are no further dogs so what is the your insights to on this particular subject how to tackle with this stray dogs because a person who is going for a walk or going for a cycling or a scooter sometimes it becomes difficult for him to move around what is the way ahead for that uh, because you are talking to a person who goes on a morning jog with stray dogs running with him uh so uh, i mean anybody who who sees me running in the morning in uh, in in the island where i go for run will see me running with about six stray dogs some of them mutilated because they've been hit by cars etc and they're all running with me and <laughs> it i think it's a matter of perception because uh, if you uh, it's it's basically a matter of perception and lack of awareness uh just as you would uh, you know when you when you see an animal for the first time you do not know what the animal is or what uh, triggers the animal you do, because you don't you simply don't know um so it's complete ignorance that prompts the fear uh for those who have uh, and animals like us uh work on the principle of trust because the animal is also going to be equally shocked seeing you um i i i'm i'm very fond of dogs and i'm i i go around you know uh, when i uh, go for my run and i see a new stray dog uh, even if i were to go near it it's going to be very reluctant to come near me uh, so over a period of time you know the the bonding increases and the trust increases and that's when uh, they befriend you like any other animal so it, it's largely a question of uh, uh, you know the perception is largely one that is influenced by awareness now coming to your point of uh, what is the uh successful way of dealing with stray dogs and the proliferation of stray dogs in the thing stray dogs uh, one of the biggest mistakes that we find happening when it comes to uh you know uh, management of stray dogs is that people lift up stray dogs from locations uh, say there's a uh, location a and uh, they lift a stray dog from location a they take him uh, they take the dog to the veterinary hospital uh, you know there's some uh, birth control measure that is uh, uh that is uh, uh deployed and then they put the dog back in place b now this you must understand is is critical uh or is uh, can be detrimental or can be uh, can be a danger when you're talking about an animal that is that functions on territory uh, an animal which is comfortable only in its own territory it's territorial animal so when you take a dog from place a it may be it may be a stick that dog knows where it where it can get food where it can get water and it's comfortable in its territory in fact it wards off other dogs from the same territory and this is something that you find you know among all uh, dogs which have the herd mentality uh, or all animals which have herd mentality or pack behavior as they call it so uh, the the mistakes that we are doing uh, we are committing are largely because of our ignorance of the behavior of these animals
experts would guide you on how to go about it. And you will find that uh, an effective way of controlling uh, stray dogs is to not touch or tamper with their territory. You can, you can protect the citizenry by simply uh, vaccinating these dogs wherever they are. Um, or else you would have to step up those measures which, were, which are contemplated in our municipal laws like uh, creating dog ponds, shelters, etc. And relocating these dogs to the safer places like shelters. Maybe there are aggressive dogs which need to be uh, put in a shelter. You do not know the trauma which they have faced which makes them aggressive. So all this requires uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, consideration by uh, experts like animal psychologists, animal uh, behavior specialists. We simply don't understand this uh, because for us, there is human beings and there is, there is this other species. And uh, you know, they are just left to fend for themselves. And you draw your own conclusions about their behavior just simply by observing them, not knowing what your behavior does to that animal. So uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, tricky situation. Now that you've actually recognized rights in them, I think now the step should be to understand them more, understand them better so that you understand what these rights translate into as far as the animal is concerned. And this, I think, is important. And that is why you need experts. And that is why you need experts advising the legislators and a legislation and an informed legislation coming into the picture. Uh, so we will, uh, though questions are pouring, we will take three questions so that we are able to wrap up. But if you intend, then we can go further. Because I thought too many questions are coming. Uh, so why doesn't the higher judiciary, this is by Anushri Shah, of our nation's Shiomoto issue guidelines keeping in view the need for animal welfare and how the public at large should abide by it like it happened in the Vishakha case? Uh, it's not as though we cannot issue, and this is, uh, this is again a repetition of what I said earlier. It is not as though the High Court cannot issue uh, or the Supreme Court cannot issue Shiomoto guidelines. But the difficulty with so motor guidelines, as I said, is that we do not have the entire information. And therefore, we are, we are just going by guesswork. Uh, and that is dangerous itself, in itself. Because uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're talking about dealing with a particular social issue, um, or in this particular case, if you're talking about an issue concerning animal welfare, we are limited in these so motor proceedings or in these public interest litigations with the material that we have with us to take our opinions. If we do not have the correct material, we could well end up giving directions which are completely at odds or variance with the interests of the animal itself. So uh, that is something that we have to be, uh, we have to guard ourselves against. I mean, it, uh, of course, there is a lot of publicity and uh, uh, given to these guidelines, etc., which may filter down to society. So implementation may not be a problem, but uh, we have to be very careful when we prescribe those guidelines because uh, God forbid we do something and prescribe a guideline which is against the interests of the animal. Uh, then that becomes the law from tomorrow and then people are just going to use it to the detriment of the animal. So, uh, Devika Raj, what is your opinion on granting the animals certain fundamental rights to avoid incidents like those that have been occurring recently? Germany granted the right to dignity to the animals. Back in the year 2002, when the constitution was amended by two-third majority. Yeah. Well, in uh, your opinion, pardon, sir. Sorry. Go ahead. Ah, uh, okay. Should I repeat it from the uh, starting? I got, I got it. In your opinion, you were saying. In your opinion, if this is adopted by India, will it be accepted by the citizens or not? Um, I don't think you need to be uh, uh, concerned there because we have already adopted it, and it is well part of our law. Uh, uh, Nagaraj actually recognizes that uh, these freedoms, the fundamental freedoms, which are the five fundamental freedoms, are actually akin or similar to the fundamental rights that are granted to humans uh, under part three of the constitution. So these freedoms, and uh, the, uh, which I enumerated, that is the freedom from hunger, thirst, and malnutrition, freedom from fear and distress, freedom from physical thermal discomfort, freedom from pain, injury, and disease, and freedom to express normal patterns of behavior of the animal. These are all freedoms that have already been placed at par with fundamental rights for humans. And they are fundamental freedoms recognized as declared as inherent in animals. Subject, of course, only to the limitation that there can be exceptions. Just as the fundamental freedoms in our constitution for human beings are restricted by reasonable restrictions, so too the fundamental 
freedoms recognized in animals are subject to the uh, exception that where a necessity of human necessity is found they must give way and that that seems to be the uh, the uh, uh, you know the deal breaker because uh, we interpret the human necessity as different things at different times and uh, that has a, uh, to a large extent deprived the full flourishing of these freedoms for the animals uh, so we have unmuted s anand he wanted to ask he had uh, posed those uh, two three questions mr anand you can put your question straight very good evening my dear lordship good evening lordship uh, one short question is veganism is the final solution for all this uh, sorry is veganism implementing veganism across religion will that, will that be the solution it can't be the solution veganism veganism must be a matter of personal opinion and personal choice it's a, it's a matter of your privacy but it can't be a, uh, if the minute you start prescribing it as a, a universal solution then you're invading you're simultaneously invading the privacy of others so uh, which incidentally has been recognized as a fundamental right for us human beings a second question being my lord thank you uh, in the pretext of development we tend to we as a people tend to as a government whatever it is tend to uh, invade the privacy of uh, animals i would uh, say like uh, the elephant card cards are being vanished just like that tigers uh, the tigers sanctuaries uh, prevention of um, those uh, locality whatever it is you know uh, what is the ultimate solution my lord uh, the ultimate and most desirable solution if you ask me as far as animal rights is concerned would be recognizing fundamental rights in animals as the, uh, as the other lady uh, mentioned without any restrictions absolute fundamental rights but i don't think that is going to be a possibility uh, that's going to be a reality because uh, even even fundamental rights for humans are not absolute so much less are they going to recognize uh, absolute fundamental rights for animals uh, besides the minute you recognize absolute fundamental rights in animals uh, you're going to have to uh, you know prevent Uh, a slaughtering of animals altogether, and which would not go down well with a, a, a huge population, which uh, thrives on non-vegetarian food uh, for their living. Uh, so, it's a it's a conflict of fundamental rights between. If you recognize it as a fundamental right of animals, you have to qualify it with uh, restrictions. Those restrictions, as of today, uh, apply when it comes to necessity of human beings. so as for the land what my personal feeling is that i may be 100% wrong the land the law of the land is not very very conducive towards animals so you you're right i mean the law of the land is always developing it is never it is never perfect at any given point in time uh, and therefore whenever we see changes in society whenever we see changes in societal attitudes we need to make those corresponding changes in the law as well um, and that's the way forward i mean the, the extent of our the the extent of liberalism in our law will be reflective of the civility extent of civility in our society at the end it will become uh, some of the endangered species will become extinct in the extent correct i mean that that that's a danger we, i mean that's the danger that we have lived with uh, throughout civilization and uh, that's also an aspect of uh, you know the survival of the fittest theory of darwin so uh, extinction need not be only because of a lack of laws uh it can also happen through natural causes thank you very much my my lordship before we uh, take the next question we are unmuting nandini as uh, my lord was saying i will just apprise two persons there is one anurag chopra a young lawyer in the high court during this lockdown he had adopted large number of stray animals because he felt that nobody is going to feed them so everybody acknowledge that fact and second we have a legal correspondent in one of the le leading newspaper that, that that is the tribune and we always find him that at his place you will find large number of stray animals maybe it's cat maybe it's dog so there are persons as they say it's not necessary that you are a human being but it's also important that being human is very important yes. so i have unmuted nandini i just wanted to give them insights that whatever way of society you are living you will find both one who hates the animals not only the stray dogs even the pets some don't like but there are certain people who actually look forward how they can help it's just like some persons for human being also have a very sensitive and for human beings also some are not very sensitive 
Uh, I've unmuted Nandini. Nandini can ask the question directly. Um, hi, Nandini. can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, so after the incident with the elephant in Kerala, it came out that the pineapple that had been stuffed with firecrackers was originally left for the wild boar, which are considered pests there. Yeah. Like they're listed as pests. Mm -hmm. So aren't there more humane ways to prevent them from eating crops instead of firecrackers? And why isn't the government implementing methods like uh, that are more humane? Certainly, certainly. There, there, in fact, uh, the uh, Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act itself uh, prescribes that you know you cannot have these dangerous, uh, cruel ways of killing animals, even if it was to uh, trap wild boars, which are uh, wild boars would come under the Wildlife Protection Act. But there too, you have you have you have rules which say that you cannot use such methodologies for uh, trapping animals uh, because that would amount to cruelty. Um, but um, on the question of whether it can be enforced, of course, it, and if I'm not mistaken, I think the investigation is still ongoing in the in the elephant case, uh, where the uh, police as well as the uh, forest department are collecting uh, material before they can formally charge the perpetrators. I think they have one or two have already been apprehended. So it's it's not as though we will not do anything once we come across this. But I think the the larger question here is uh, what. Uh, legislations, what law do we have in place to deal with uh, or to prevent such action in future? And because uh, we don't need incidents like this to spark off a debate like this. I mean, we, this should have actually preceded it so that we could have avoided this issue altogether. Uh, the deterrence in, uh, uh, in our laws is not effective, is not, uh, is not sufficient, uh, I would say, because uh, for a person who uh, you know, is uh, threatened with a penalty of uh, 50 rupees or 100 rupees if he does something like this, uh, it's not going to operate as a deterrent. But if he finds that, you know, uh, a larger uh, cost on him, maybe, you know, 50,000 um, or any, any amount higher, coupled with a threat of imprisonment for a longer period, um, maybe that would work as a deterrent. But that again is a, is a question that has to be uh, answered after looking into the uh, you know, possibilities or looking into the effect that uh, a penal provision would have on the citizenry. Okay. Uh, one question is by, this is the last question we'll be taking, uh, Dipti from Bangalore. Resident welfare associations, can they ban stray animals? Would it be legal or illegal? No, when you say ban on uh, stray animals, what exactly do you mean? I mean, uh, how do you ban stray animals? They, they're stray because they, they don't have a place to go. So uh, how do you ban stray animals? I mean, they, they're not going to understand the language of ban. Uh, I, can unmute, uh, I can unmute so that she can. Dipti. So meanwhile, we, uh, when Dipti is being unmuted, one fact after this entire Dipti, uh, you can ask the question directly. Dipti, you're not audible. Dipti? Hello? Hello? Yeah, there's, uh, you're very barely audible. Dipti, you have to roll like a loin. So she's not been able to. Okay. Instead, we can take. Uh, do you believe that uh, just like for uh, what is your take on companion animals besides dog for which some legislation seems to exist? Would that overlap with the human freedoms mentioned? I don't think so, because uh, uh, again, after Nagaraj recognized those freedoms, uh, uh, quite recently uh, in Kerala High Court, uh, uh, division bench of which I was heading, uh, we, we uh, passed an order in favor of a owner of cats, uh, which enabled him to get some cat food for his uh, cats during the lockdown period. 
but the uh, my companion judge who wrote the uh, who wrote a judgment of his own went to the extent of saying that uh, the uh, the uh, the desire of a person to keep a pet of his choice is also a part of the human being's fundamental right and it also uh, uh, conforms or gels with the freedoms recognized in the animal itself. Uh, uh, basically, a fear of uh, freedom from physical thermal discomfort, freedom from hunger, thirst, malnutrition, all these are actually realized through the adoption by the owner of the pet. So, uh, when this becomes an integral aspect of his choice, because right now after Puttasami's case, uh, the fundamental right to privacy has been recognized, although not absolute. But once you recognize the fundamental right of privacy, Privacy, one of the aspects of privacy is your right to choice. And if you choose to keep a pet, unless the pet is so, uh, uh, you know, uh, a pet is a wild animal, <laughs> in which case it would not be a pet in the first place. Uh, if, if, if he chooses to keep any other animal as, as a pet, then that itself is a fundamental right of choice as far as the individual is concerned. And therefore, these two rights basically complement each other. One recognizes the right of the human being and then simultaneously it also recognizes the freedom or realizes the freedom of the animal. So, uh, we have taken a lot of questions and I on behalf of Beyond Law CLC, uh, thank you. Initially, uh, no, she, Diptis has said that she couldn't get herself unmuted because there was already a problem. Her question is, many RWS have banned pets and strays in the community. Uh, that question continues to remain the same. Is she, she says whether this passing of law is legal or not. That you had answered that how can the animals be sensitized as to whether there is a ban or not. But the fact that the uh, present session has been liked by one and all, I just received somebody uh, sending me a message uh, that uh, he's doing research on the animal protection law in Pace University. So it shows the volume that we have seen from Bangalore, Chandigarh, Kerala, Mumbai, that one fact during all this lockdown and otherwise is that social media is such that at, at the first instance when we started these all webinars, we never thought that we could get the participants not only in India but uh, we had just thought that it was a trigger point. It started from our office, then Chandigarh, then beyond and beyond. And some people actually say that we have actually gone beyond law to discuss all these issues. And the insights on having animal protection law, as I candidly said, that initially when the topic was done, I thought it is only on wildlife protection. Then it was transportation. As they say that you, you don't understand the light until unless you actually see that. So once uh, I was also examining what could be the scope, etc. Then I realized, no, the scope is too much. Then uh, I would be very candid about that. Then I thought that the scope is so much. How could you assimilate all these facts to bring in an art session that it could be done? But again, when you had put all the facts and when we initially said that being a gold medalist and there's then an LMS from Oxford show that what is the difference between an ordinary and extraordinary? That extra effort to understand the things uh, is the effort. Before we part, we'll also like, since they are students and law. As a student of law, now this is not a topic uh, with the animals law. What is your take that while drafting or while preparing, one how, how could one create, I'm taking this question after a lot of webinars, because initially we all, always used to take, what is your take that how one should assimilate the facts, research the law, and create a mark where every, they say, at the bottom, it's always heavy, and you are only on the, lonely on the top. So how to create that niche to actually reach on the top that people understand that, like you have shown that animal law is a law which is not referred much in the courts, not, not many lawyers know it, not many students know it, not many people in the public at large know what is the law as such and what is the way forward ahead? So what is your take on that for a lawyer? What should he do or a student? Or a, since we are, I've seen that there are a large number of 
animal lovers who have also participated. So be that as it may, whatever situation you are, one will always try to create a niche so that he's separate. Uh, what is your take on that? Now, are, you, are you referring to uh, a specialization in animal protection? No, no. I'm, I'm just saying that how to how to actually assimilate the facts, how to research the law, Generally. how to create a niche within the society. The short answer to that, as far as a student of law is concerned, if he, he, he or she wants to make, uh, make it to the top as a lawyer, the only thing that will drive him is passion, a passion for the subject. Uh, if you have the passion for the subject, everything else is incidental. Uh, uh, I believe that if you have a, a passion for the law, and uh, you, you, uh, right from the initial uh, stages, your passion uh, for the subject will guide you into the best methodology which you find uh, for being as persuasive at your persuasive best before the person who is hearing your case. So it is always it is always a preparation of a case for the person before whom you are going to present the case. So it, there is no one size fits all formula. Um, when a lawyer argues a case, he has to keep in mind the facts of the case. He must do a research in the law. But more importantly, if he's a practicing, if he's a litigating lawyer, he needs to know where his case is coming. He needs to know the judge before whom it is uh, coming. And he needs to understand the views of the judge. And today, all this is possible with, with uh, software that is available at the disposal of the, uh, of the law student. Uh, the minute you have all this uh, equipment, your passion sees it through. Um, you, will, you will draft the uh, petition in a way, uh, assimilating the facts, etc. Because you would be the master of facts. If you have a passion to know more about your case, you would go into the details. You would get all the facts relevant to your case. You would put that in, uh, in order. And then you would, you would shape your draft. Because as I said, there's no one size fits all. Each judge comes with his own idiosyncrasies, eccentricities, etc. So when, when you draft it, you need to find that one spot which will appeal to him or her. And you need to draft your entire petition in a manner that will catch his eye. And uh, that is the hallmark of a successful litigating lawyer. Uh, I, I keep telling students whenever I meet them, and I meet a lot of them because I, I, I go to lecture at the universities and the colleges. Um, I always tell them that uh, do not be swayed by what you do in your moot courts, etc. In moot courts, you are being judged for your performance as a lawyer. In other words, what is being judged is you as a person. When you come before a court, what is being judged is a cause, not the person. And it really does, we, we really don't have the time to admire your rhetoric and your dress and your appearance and your gait. We want only the facts, the law and what it is. We need to understand the issue, we need to find a solution. And uh, when we are talking about the volumes of cases that are that a court in India handles, we simply don't have the luxury to sit and appreciate your rhetoric. So uh, that may sound uh, uh, rude <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a sense, but that is reality. So most uh, law students, they have, they, they, and the, the, one, the, the law students that come out today from uh, all the universities and law colleges, they are, they are they're certainly endowed with a lot more of talent and wisdom and, uh, and knowledge than the lawyers and law students of yesteryears because they have they've had the uh, advantage of a superior system of education in law uh, which you find available in most of the law colleges today so uh, the standards is definitely uh, going up and we find a lot of research going into uh, into the presenting of cases and i think that's a welcome sign and uh, i have great hope for the profession and, I, I, and I, I, I'm a big admirer of the present generation of lawyers, uh, especially the ones who are coming out of law schools these days, uh, because they, they, they seem to be very focused in their approach. And I think that's a, that's, a, uh, that's, a trait, that's a trait to be found in that generation itself. Uh, they're more focused than what their previous generation. That's my take on the work. It goes without saying. Actually, uh, there's a different, the assimilation of the facts, the research, is different. Uh, another take would be that they all know that one has to be more industrious. But the finding of the research, what was around 20, 25 years ago, the method of with Google and artificial intelligence, that you just put 
put in the keywords the research is different the the issues are different where you can find but be that as it may one cannot take the shine or uh, the sheen in that aspect to state therein that they are not working hard the, the bench is growing in the knowledge and values so uh, questions still are continuing even though we said but be that as it may uh, thank you on behalf of beyond law clc and to the effect that you have given the insights to a subject which is not invariably covered uh, anywhere in the courts the schools etc so we are all thankful to you not only on the participants who participated straight live but also to the participants who are participating on the facebook to have an insights to a topic which would the way you have presented would always be kept engaging in their minds they have got insights and they will have during that lockdown period that the issues which have been dealt on the points they could ponder upon they can look upon it and we are quite sacrosanct that the wishful wishes which you had being an animal lover that some issues pan india would be taken up somewhere sometime uh, everyone stay blessed and stay healthy during these lockdown times but since we are taking sessions day to day tomorrow we have a session of criminal justice and the rule of law in india and the it would be addressed by none else than justice j chamleshwar former judge of the supreme court of india along with him is uh, doc, dr argo sen gupta research director of vidhi center for uh, legal policies so stay connected tomorrow same time 5 pm and a different and engaging session from our side we put all our efforts so that people can get the different insights thank you everyone stay blessed stay healthy thank you sir thank you